Okay, good afternoon. Let's try it again. Good afternoon. That's much better. Uh, my name is Marshall Gans, and um, I'm pleased to welcome you to uh, the John F. Kennedy Forum this afternoon uh, for the opportunity to reflect on the status of organized labor in America with two very distinguished guests, uh, U.S. Secretary of Labor, the Honorable Hilda Solis, uh, and President Emeritus of the AFL-CIO, Mr. John Sweeney. Let's welcome them. Over, over the past 30 years, uh, policymakers, academics, and much of the public have come to see labor unions as a relic of a bygone era, and if anything, part of our problem, as in education, for example, not part of the solution. The consequences for working people of a weakened labor movement, however, have been catastrophic. Real wage decline, evaporating jobs, longer hours, and deteriorating working conditions. But union decline is not only a problem for workers. In large measure, the galloping social inequality, dysfunctional electoral system, and persistent weakening of public institutions, let alone extension into new domains like healthcare, can be traced to the decline of the once powerful role of labor unions in what John Kenneth Galbraith once described as a system of countervailing power. America's workers and uh, uh, most of all, those who've never enjoyed uh, union representation have been our miners' canaries. You know, when the miners would go down into the mines, they would take a canary because its weak respiratory system meant it would detect poison in the mines by keeling over, giving the miners time to escape. And as the crises in healthcare, home ownership, the integrity of our public institutions themselves show, there is poison in this mine. And the most vulnerable have suffered first, but that's catching up to all of us. John Sweeney, perhaps more than anyone else, has had to wake up with the responsibility to meet this challenge every morning for the last five decades. Mr. Sweeney grew up in Bronx, New York, where his parents, Irish immigrants, worked as a bus driver and as a domestic worker. And after graduating from Iona College, which he was the first in his, in his family to attend, and earned his tuition working as a union grave digger and building porter. Uh, the first union he found his calling in uh, in the labor movement was with the International Lady, Lady Garment Workers Union. In 1961, he joined the Service Employees International Union Local 32B in New York City in 1960 as a union representative, later becoming its president, uh, and in 1980 was elected president of the Service Employees International Union which uh, during his presidency grew from 625,000 to 1.1 million members during the 15 years of his leadership. In 1995, Mr. Sweeney was elected president of the 11.5 million member AFL-CIO where he served four terms, stepping down last year to become president emeritus and an IOP fellow. He lives in Washington with his wife Maureen, a former school teacher. They have two grown children, John and Patricia, and a daughter, Kennedy. Please welcome my good friend, uh, John Sweeney. Thank you very much, Marshall Gans. Thanks for all the great work that you've done throughout your life, especially focused on organizing new workers, and uh, a great deal of your time was spent in building the Farm Workers Union with Cesar Chavez and and now you're uh, organizing the students at Harvard in the Kennedy School. And we're delighted to be with you. Brothers and sisters and friends, our featured speaker today is a true friend and champion of anyone who has ever picked a crop, swung a hammer, pushed a broom, assembled an automobile, cared for a patient, flown a commercial airline, or worked at any of the millions of jobs done every day by what we call America's working class. Indeed, this daughter of immigrant parents from Nicaragua and Mexico struggled her way up through the poverty of East Los Angeles to become the class 
of our working class. Hilda Solis graduated from California State Polytechnical Institute and the University of Southern California. Before her election to four terms in the United States Congress, she served in the California State Assembly as well as the California State Senate. We were so proud when she was nominated by President Obama as Secretary of Labor. She had to endure one of the toughest confirmation battles in the history of the United States Congress. That's because corporate controlled members of Congress knew who she was, a warrior who stands for working people over special interests, for equality of opportunity over discrimination, and for safe workplaces over cozy corners in posh restaurants for business lobbyists. When she was finally confirmed in 2009, she immediately announced, there's a new sheriff in town, and went right to work doing what renegade companies feared she'd do. She hired 710 new enforcement agents and inspectors and restored staffing in our worker protection agencies to where it was before the previous administration cut right through the bone. She revived long abandoned OSHA and MESHA standards. She increased funding for enforcement of wage and hour law protections, including with a $25 million initiative to make sure workers are properly classified and to restore protections for workers who'd been classified improperly. She implemented strong Davis-Bacon provisions in the Economic Recovery Act and awarded a historic number of labor management grants for training, many of them in green jobs industries. She squeezed, she squeezed $44 billion out of the federal budget for unemployment insurance modernization, UI benefits, trade adjustment, COBRA, and the National Employment, National Emergency Grants. She's more than just a new sheriff. She knows it's high noon for working families, and she always draws first. <laughs> Brothers and sisters and friends, the 25th Secretary of Labor, the first Latina to serve in that office, the first woman of Hispanic heritage to hold a presidential cabinet position, the Honorable Hilda Solis. Thank you. Thank you, President Sweeney. President Sweeney will always be my president, and he'll always be my hero. Thank uh, you for all your leadership and the service to working men and women across this country. You spent so many years fighting for the rights of janitors to have dignity and respect, and then you led our great country as serving as president of the AFL-CIO to champion justice for all working men and women. And I met you, I think, in Los Angeles on several occasions when we worked hand in hand, locking arms, whether it was to fight against 187, that we, were, we didn't defeat initially, but it never went into play, never was implemented. And then we worked side by side organizing janitors, and people thought that could never be done. But I think I'm a lot like you, John. When people say you can't do it, you say, let me show you how. <laughs> so I salute you for everything that you do. You've been a tireless champion also for so many of us and a leader. Uh, while I served in the House of Representatives, you were their champion issues on minimum wage at that time, overtime, health care issues, and family medical leave. At every moment that I was on the floor, I knew that you were there. Your spirit, your actions, and many of the things that you fought for were well articulated by many in the House that truly understood what you represented and what we were there for as well. So I want to thank you for that. I also want to thank Marshall Gans for hosting me today, uh, for allowing me the opportunity to be here. Um, it's taken me a while to get here, John, but we made it. <laughs> 18 months, and we're here. So this is a good day, and it's a great place to be here 
at uh, the Harvard uh, School of Public Policy and to be here in this very prestigious location. We share a history of work, um, Marshall, and you know that. We go way back in California politics working on issues regarding farm workers and social justice. You've been promoting, organizing, and you've done especially a, a hard and long type of work to help provide assistance for the Obama for America campaign, and we thank you for that. The administration thanks you for that, and we thank you for that, for training and inspiring young volunteers to get involved. And I believe, as you do, that there's a power in connecting our own personal stories. I think that's probably one of the most important parts of what I can share here today with all of you. Our stories about work on social justice and public policy. And that's really where I think my, my story begins because I know as a child, um, I was always asking myself, what is it that I can do to better, not just my life or my family's life, but what could I do to help improve other people's lives? And as a youngster growing up, you don't, of, you don't often hear that from a 12-year-old or an 11-year-old. But I remember when I was growing up that when I would turn on the television, I recall the body counts from Vietnam. I was a child, but I knew what that meant. And I knew what it meant for our community. And I knew what it meant for seeing so many from our area, from the t small town that I grew up in. Uh, actually, it was a, a small town called La Puente. It was about, oh, very blue-collar, working class, high immigrant. We didn't know we were poor. But nevertheless, that was our home. But I remember at that time, there was a whole lot of social conflict. There was a lot of people protesting in the streets. And every time we turn on the television, you'd hear the number enumerated of how many deaths, how many body bags were coming back from Vietnam. And why was it that there was so much discrimination? And why were so few people from communities like mine that were given access and opportunities to go to college and have good careers? Why was it that we were always relegated to a different type of work or lifestyle? So that's where my community involvement and my spark of interest, I think, started way back then. I want to mention also that it's a very important time for me to be here, because I'm looking also back at the year 2000 when I received the John F. Kennedy Profile and Courage Award, the first Latina, first woman ever to be named and given that award. And that was in the spring of 2000. And it was right after um, I had gone through a very serious uh, congressional race at that time. And I had worked for many years in the, in the House, the state legislature, working in the Assembly, and more importantly, in the State Senate. And I think I may have been maybe one of the few women who ever served as chair of the Industrial Relations Committee. And I was very, very proud to be able to serve at that time, to be able to work on uh, issues affecting worker safety, worker protection, and minimum wage issues, and fairness. And I can tell you that many great people worked alongside with me. And Hilda Solis doesn't come alone. Hilda Solis brings a lot of folks with her. Her family values, her family, and people that I worked with that believe just as strongly as I do in seeing justice for so many people. So many of the things that I have been able to accomplish have not come by my, by my hand alone. There's been many other people helping to push me along. And I can recall. When I did receive that award, and, and actually before I received it, I got a call from Caroline Kennedy. I got a call from my staff calling me at home, and I remember it was during Easter break, and Caroline was on the other line, and my staff said, there's a call from Caroline Kennedy, and I'm like, oh my god, what have I done? <laughs> and she said, would you honor us by receiving the John F. Kennedy Profile and Courage Award? And I just about fell off the bed, because <laughs> I was literally <laughs> laying down. Um, and I couldn't believe it. And she told me that she wanted to give me the award based on my work on minimum wage, uh, which I was working on. And we had um, worked the legislative process, but saw that bill defeated three times and vetoed three times by then Pete Wilson. But I also worked on issues regarding environmental justice, something that her brother, John, John Jr. worked very tirelessly on. And she wanted to remember him in a special way by presenting an award to someone who was an advocate for environmental justice, but also for social justice, and to also, I, I believe, have her own mark, and to say, you know what? It's time to give it to a woman. <laughs> so I happened to be at the right place, I guess, at the right time. But nonetheless, it was a proud moment to be asked and honored 
uh, to receive that uh, special award. And it's something that meant so much to me because at the time, Senator uh, Ted Kennedy was there to present it to me. So that, in, an, in and of itself, was a historic moment. I mean, that was a, a life changer for not only me, but for my parents and the people um, that I represent, that I represented in my community. And now that, we're, that, we're, that I'm sitting here, I look back and say, well, how is it that I got here? How is it that I became the uh, cabinet secretary? And I think about all the things that I have been involved in in my life, and especially in politics, in public service. And politics, I kind of put that in a special bracket and say, well, politics can be very mean, it can be very helpful, but it can also be very abusive, depending on who controls what the politics are of the day and how that's run. But I always looked at being involved in changing in social movements and trying to provide social justice in a way that called upon people. And I look back at John F. Kennedy and I think about what he said about public service and about the need to, to really work on trying to make the best, of the best of who we are when we give of ourselves. And that is by not asking what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. And we don't often think about that in this, in this world that we live in. And I, as growing up, always thought, what can I do? What can I do to help change things? Well, part of it is, is immersing yourself in that change. Change doesn't happen because it's just spontaneous. You can help impact that change by getting involved and taking action. And that's something that I learned over time. And it's something that you don't necessarily get from a textbook or understand in terms of just theory, but it's actually the practical application. And that's where I come from, I guess. Because I'm not an academician, I'm not a lawyer, however I wanted to be a lawyer, but I can tell you I've written more laws than lawyers have <laughs> that are in the codes in California as well as in the federal government. So you see, there is no real clear-cut <laughs> design in terms of how you can impact people's lives. So I still carry that, that, um, that torch in my heart as to wanting to make change for people and getting involved with other people and sharing what I know and, and really surrounding myself around people who have more knowledge than I do because that's really what makes things matter. If you can call and draw out people's strengths and then pick and choose and see what works best and that's something that I have been able to do, I think, in the course of my, of my life. I know right now times are very tough, especially for young people, especially for those of you that are thinking about what you're going to do when you graduate, and if you're even going to have a job, and if your career is really going to be something lasting, and will you have to maybe make change of plans and maybe stay home <laughs> longer with your parents? or maybe have to change a whole design of what you thought you wanted to do? Well, those are all very valid questions that you should be asking yourselves because they're very real. I think the, the way that we've been taught that you get a good education, you get that foundation, those are all still valid. I'm not saying they're not. They really are. But I think that people have to become more adaptable and people have to understand that flexibility is a big part of who we are and where you want to go. And you can make changes in your life by, by being both flexible and adaptable. And that means getting to know people around you, getting to know your surroundings, getting to know people who may be able to help you. And that's what I did in my legislative career. I also worked very closely when I did get elected to the House. And I think this is important to state. I did take on an incumbent. And it wasn't talked a lot about, but in 2000, I was actually ostracized by some of my Democratic colleagues because I took on another Hispanic. And you don't do that. You don't, how dare you, Hilda, take on a Latino from East LA. <laughs> and, I <coughs> and I think about it now and I say to myself, you know why I did it? It wasn't a personal issue. It was more of a social justice issue. It was about change that my community, in my opinion, needed to have, needed to, needed to see, needed to feel, and needed to have a voice in a, in a bigger arena that had changed from 18 years past. Some people get elected to office in Congress and other places and stay around and stay around, and things don't seem to change. 
But there are some people who learn to rein reinvent themselves. Unfortunately, in this, this particular position, I don't think that individual really did that. And so I took a chance. I didn't have a lot of support from folks that I traditionally would have, but I will tell you one thing. The people that did stay with me were my friends in the labor movement. They were my biggest supporters, and I will never forget that. I also had environmental justice groups behind me, Conservation Corps. I also had women's groups, and I had a coalition of other civil rights and different immigrant organizations, a new body politic that was now coming together, almost kind of like a mini Obama campaign, okay? But that was like fast forward. <laughs> but nevertheless, it was about bringing coalitions together. So it was an exciting time, and once I landed in, in the House, in the Congress, I then began to meet some of the leaders there, because they were very curious. How is it that this young, in, in their opinion, how did this youngster, how did this kid get elected? And um, I think once they got to know me and what my values were and the work that I did, then they started to take me around, and some were very good mentors to me. In fact, one was a very prominent congressman who ran for uh, governor in Michigan and lost. David Bonnier, Congressman David Bonnier, who was a mentor to many people in the House of Representatives. He took me under his wing, and he made me one of his whips. And I don't know if you know what that term is, whip, but what you do is, in the House, we are organized in a caucus, the Democratic caucus, and you have different positions, kind of like lieutenant positions. The whip position is someone who goes out and tallies votes and gets people to vote the right way so we're all on message and we're all in sync. And he asked me to do that as a freshman class whip. And so I was a bit intimidated because I didn't know what a whip was. But after getting involved, and he kind of showed me the ropes, I got more acclimated. But I also met some very important people there that I grew very good, strong relations, relationships with. And one of whom I hold very dear to my heart is Speaker Nancy Pelosi. Because she went through many battles while I was there. And I spent eight years in the House eight years building relationships, but working with her. And she wasn't a mother figure by any means. She was a very brass tactics, get down to it, systematic, very, very strategic. Something that everybody should think about. I have someone around like that that can think in that manner and kind of put things aside and just reason with you and tell you what it is you need to do. And do it with all your guts. That's something you don't often hear from other women, but that's something that she shared shared with me. So she, she and I became good friends, and I learned a lot. I even got close to uh, Rahm Emanuel, who some of you are probably hearing today is going to be leaving, or has left, resigned the White House, and now is going to be running for another political office. We worked very hard in 2006 with the leadership of Nancy Pelosi to help bring back the House. At that time, we were going through a whole lot of changes. The situation politically was very, was very uh, fluid. And as a part of <clears throat> a team working with Rahm Emanuel, my, my role with him was to go out and do what they call candidate recruitment. That is to meet people out in the field and recruit candidates to run to represent our party who could best address issues from their home districts. That's not a lot of easy work to do. It's a lot of hard work. And then also raise money, which is kind of the other thing that some people don't like to talk about, but is a necessary evil that has to be a part of it because how can we get our social justice working class agenda through when you're up against big lobbyists like the chambers, big corporate America, or folks that are overseas determining what the politics should be and the policies should be? So to me, it was very important to help get good people elected. So that was something that I was able to share with, uh, with you through my short time there in, in the House. But now, as a part of the cabinet, it's changed a bit. And you've heard, I come from a working class family. <clears throat> My mother and father actually met in Los Angeles in an English class. They wanted to become integrated into this society. Both came and spent many, many years in Los Angeles and raised their seven children. And I'm the third of seven. And I'm not the first, right? And, but was the first to go to college, in part because there was some good policies through the war on poverty that allowed for more liberal financial aid, like the Pell Grant program, like the student aid program, the guaranteed student loan program, and the work study program. I'll never forget those programs. That was my life bread. That's what kept me going. That's what allowed me to be able to do the things that I'm doing now. 
because my parents came from a working class background and did not have the means to send their daughter to college. So many students that I see and hear from in families are going through the same thing now, where it's hard to put money away. It's even harder now. And that's why we have to have good policies that allow for more liberal spending and financial aid and student loan programs and be able to work off your, your loans through community service or working in high poverty areas in medicine or teaching or any other profession. Those are good things to have in our society. I think they're very important. But to go back a little bit about <clears throat> my family, my father was a shop steward for the Teamsters. And at the time growing up, I didn't, didn't think anything was, was extraordinary about where, where I grew up. In fact, we had, a big, we had a big family, nine of us, seven children, three-bedroom house. Yes, we had bunk beds and all that. <laughs> and everyone knew that you uh, had to be there early on time, otherwise you'd lose out. So I learned that very quick. But one thing that I remember the most from my parents is that hard work was always something that you would be rewarded for. So if you worked hard and you showed respect to people, to your neighbors and to your friends, that was something that was always of value no matter what. My father <clears throat> also taught me the value of work and dignity and respecting people no matter where they come from. If they're working in, in a factory, if they're working on an assembly line, it doesn't matter. People who work with their hands deserve just as much attention and dignity and respect as those people that are also in the corporate boardrooms that are drawing down maybe six, seven-figure salaries. And so I bring that with me today um, as a Secretary of Labor, someone who thinks that my role isn't just to sheriff and police what goes on around the country with respect to worker protection, but to also make clear that it's a good thing to support workers. It's a good thing to respect workers' rights to organize. It's a good thing when you can rely on health care benefits. It's a good thing when you can count on a retirement and pension. And it's a bad thing when things get outsourced. And it's a bad thing when unscrupulous business owners or corporations can get away with cutting corners on safety and protection and somehow allow for people to go into dangerous environments, work environments, every single day or every single shift, not even knowing that they're going to be able to come home at the end of that shift. And I'm not even going to say at night, because you got people that sometimes work four shifts, different shifts. And I can tell you, one that comes to mind for me is the accident hazard that occurred back in April. One of the first major tragic accidents that occurred in West Virginia, and that's the Upper Big Branch, mine explosion. I don't know if you're aware of that. 29 mi miners did not come back out alive from that dangerous mine because we had an operator, a mine operator there, who thought it was better business to, to somehow pump out more natural resources there and put their workers at risk and not mind the store appropriately and not abide by some of the rules that we have asked them to play by when you operate a mine like that of that size and that magnitude. What remains true for me is the fact that I had a chance to meet with the families. That's something that that will always burn in my memory. Not, not so much watching <clears throat> what was happening inside the mine, but the fact that there were so many people that wanted explanations. The family members, the spouses, the daughters, the aunts, the uncles, the brothers, the cousins, and a grandfather. A grandfather who had black lung disease, who was sitting in his car when he heard I was there to visit, said, Secretary, I'm waiting to hear if my grandson's coming out alive. My grandson's 25 years old. This poor man was on a respirator, and he could barely talk. He could barely breathe. He had worked 30 years in the mind, and he had black lung disease. So here I'm thinking, my God, he survived. He survived the worst of what can happen in a bad situation. And yet his grandson, later on, we would find out, didn't make it out. He didn't, have, he didn't make it out. And there's no reason why those 29 miters couldn't have made it out. Had that operator abided by the rules, played by the rules, had heeded to the warnings that were given to him by different agencies, and our agency as well, MSHA, there could, that tragedy probably could have been prevented. I pray that this doesn't happen again, but there are many other instances where things are happening. And all you have to do is look at Louisiana, what happened there with the oil spill. We lost 11 individuals there, 
needlessly as well because of carelessness and lack of oversight and enforcement. And now, as a result, many people have lost their job there in the Gulf states. But that's not the end of the story. Yeah, they, they plug the hole, but what happens to the lives of people there? What happens to those people who lost their jobs? What happens to the black shrimper and fishermen, the Vietnamese oyster, oystermen or fishermen that don't have anything now and have to wait to see if they're going to be able to go out and fish again or what's going to happen to their 20 years of livelihood that they spent creating their businesses? Well, the government has a role to play. And I see it in terms of the Department of Labor trying to help provide assistance there, whether it's going after BP, which we will do, or helping people understand the system so that they can obtain whatever assistance, whether it's workforce training opportunities, UI benefits, or if they need help in maybe getting into a new career. Maybe now it'll be in conservation. Maybe now it'll be in renewable energy. Maybe now it will be in conserving what is left of the wetlands there. But nevertheless, we have to give hope to people, and we have to make a stake in this because it is our, it is our country, and these are our people. And that's something that people have to be reminded of. <clears throat> I'm going to skip around a little bit here. My staff's going to be very upset because I didn't read <laughs> their speech. But I want to tell you something that... <laughs> <laughs> but you know, that's... That's the Secretary of Labor. <laughs> I think one of the things that is important for us to realize is that the Department of Labor has really changed. You know, John Sweeney, President John Sweeney said it very well. It's a new department. It has a new life. We've resuscitated it. We put back funding where funding was needed for enforcement and protection for workers and worker safety and also for oversight and hopefully helping to get people out of the ditch, the ditch so we can find hope and find good jobs and, and again return to that workforce that is ours, and that is manufacturing, that is IT, that is computers, that is healthcare, that is renewable energy. That is just as much a part of the Department of Labor as it is for energy, for commerce, and HHS. DOL has a role in there, and we are trying very hard to see that we can get those monies out appropriately to targeted communities so that we can make sure that people all, all can have a, sh a shot at getting back in their way of life or a new life, a new life, because it is definitely changed. We know that so many people have lost their jobs, especially in the Northeast section. The automobile industry was devastated. It's been restructured, and I'm happy to say, at least in part, about 76,000 jobs have come back as a result because of the restructuring that happened with GM and Chrysler. Some of these jobs now are not going to be the same. It's not going to be the V8 engine or the, or the or, what is it, the four cycle, six cylinder. It's going to be a hybrid vehicle. It's going to be an electric vehicle. It's going to be powered by a lithium battery. And those kinds of funds have been made available through the Recovery Act through the Obama administration. In part, we, through the Department of Labor, will work to help train people, people that were dislocated auto workers or dislocated homemakers or people that just gave up on looking for a job to get into these new technologies. And that's something that I'm very excited about. And I hope that some of you become more aware of these opportunities. Healthcare, another big area that's going to keep growing. In this recession, that's probably the only career area that I have seen growth continue. Well over 240,000 jobs have been created alone in healthcare. And I'm not talking about the top ring, I'm talking about the introductory type of jobs, the ambulatory care, the care at the front office. That's where the growth is occurring. And we need people all over the country to fill these jobs. And that's the fastest growing area, whether it's in communications or IT or healthcare IT, telemedicine, tele <clears throat> all these are areas that are going to be expanding. And we need young people to step up to the plate to be a part of this and to get some of our older workers who right now are discouraged to get back into play and to get help from us as well and to be encouraged. And I'm hoping that that's something that we can do in the next course, the next two years of this administration. And that is to help put our mark out there to let people understand that what we've been doing for the last 18 months, at least this Secretary of Labor, has really been to go out 
and talk to people and to listen to people. That's what a public servant does. You listen to problems. You try to rectify and bring together resources to mitigate those problems and try to do it in a fashion where you can help the most people. And then sharing that information with people that the president surrounds himself with to get them to buy into those public policies that will then impact many, many people. That's the role that I play right now at the Department of Labor. And let me tell you, it is an exciting time. People ask me, well, Hilda, how many times do you get to go to a cabinet meeting? How many times do you see the president? It's not a matter of how many times. It's the quality of time that you spend with the president, don't you think? You know, that's what matters, that he takes you seriously and that he takes your thoughts and your words as something that's important. And I take that as a compliment, something that I, that I know we've worked all hard to get to, but it's something that means a lot, that our words have value. And when I speak, I'm happy to say that the president, president asked me when, when he initially invited me to join his cabinet, he said, Hilda, I'm not, I'm not bringing you into this because you've managed 16,000 employees, because I hadn't, right? That's not on my resume. I was a House member. I was a senator. I was the boss. <laughs> now the tables turn. Now I would have to report to him, and I'd have to also oversee a very large organization that has tentacles that even touch other foreign countries because we deal in labor relations. And he, he told me, quite frankly, Hilda, the reason why I chose you was because you're going to be a voice. Simply put, a voice. When no one else is going to talk around the table about issues that working men and women are going to need, that we're going to need to hear, you're going to be the one that's going to bring it up. And I looked at him, and I was stunned. And I, and I understood him very well. And I thank him every single day for the opportunity to serve, to be, to be in a position now to be able to help so many other people, but to make a different in, difference in people's lives and to hopefully encourage young people to take a path also of giving back, of giving to public service, and also helping your community. Don't forget. Don't forget where you come from. Don't forget the people that help you get there, and then give back. And I think those are very simple kinds of rules that many people have lived by. That's why our country is so great, because, are we, because in many ways there's so many people that are selfless. They really do want to give. So I want to just say with that, um, probably gone on too long, <laughs> but um, it's been a real pleasure to be here. I know we're going to take some, some questions from the audience, and I want to thank all of you for being so patient and listening today. And it's a real honor to be here at this very prestigious university. Thank you. Thank you. So now we get to, oh boy, they're already lined up out here. All <laughs> right, well, that's good. Um, just a few ground rules as uh, those of you who've uh, participated in the forum before. Uh, we ask each questioner to uh, please identify yourself. Um, we'll have one brief question per person, no speeches, and the best questions are those that end with a question mark. <laughs> and uh, why don't we start over here? My name is Lily Oster. I'm a freshman here at Harvard College, and a theme that was running throughout your speech was um, social justice and the commitment you had to it uh, when you were a young person. And I'm, I want to ask you about a social justice issue that many young people today all around the world are concerned about. I've seen how HIV AIDS is crippling the economies and the workforces of many countries around the world, and the Obama administration committed to increasing funding around the, around the world for, um, uh, different, for both PEPFAR and the Global Fund to Fight AIDS. And there is a, um, a conference on Monday to, to replenish the Global Fund um, that's taking place in Washington. And I want, I want to know, it, my question to you is this, will you go back to Washington and ask President Obama to make a commitment of $5 billion over three years uh, to fight HIV AIDS, which will help um, uh, restore the economies of many, of many countries around the world. Okay. 
Well, before I entered into this uh, room here, I was outside, I believe, speaking to many students that were out um, voicing their, their opinions about continuing to fund uh, HIV and AIDS globally. And that's something that has been a big part of my career uh, in the legislature long before I came to Washington advocating for health care services for poor and especially for those victims that are afflicted by that disease. It's preventable. We need to do more. And I would hope that um, we'll have support by individuals in the administration, and I'll do what I can. I'll share, I'll share your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. Over here. Hello. Thank you again for being with us today. Um, my name is Alice Shong, and I'm a sophomore at the college. And my question was, given that throughout your career in public service, you've achieved many firsts as a Latin American woman, how do you feel that your um, ethnic heritage and your gender have affected or um, shaped your perspective on politics or your um, path in public service? Well, you know, it's, um, it's kind of a, a double-edged sword, so to speak, because part of it is not, not being overwhelmed by what other people want to stereotype you as. And that's kind of the first thing that I had to do, was to say, you know what, I don't want to be classified by somebody's definition. And I think that's been true for me in my career, because I've been able to break through in so many ways. And it wasn't because I had anything special going for me. It was because I managed to work with other people, with other groups. So Hilda Solis doesn't come as like a little package of Hispanic or Latino issues. She's much more than that. She cares about HIV and AIDS. She cares about health care. She cares about poverty. She cares about equal pay for equal work. She cares about domestic violence. All these issues, kind of issues that affect all of us. And being able to encapsulate that and kind of present my, my feelings and my values in that way and sharing them through all the different uh, elected offices that I had and being able to do that. So yes, I'm a woman. Yes, I'm a minority. That's pretty clear. But that isn't a hindrance for me, and I don't see it as that. And when people, when people try to tell you that, that's when you have to say, you're wrong. I'm just as capable, you're just as capable of doing anyone else's job if you really put your mind to it. And I think that's something that women, especially minority women, don't hear enough of. We don't hear it enough from our own families and from our, from our own brothers at times. And we need to hear that. We need to be able to, to help each other. Because some of the, the strongest advocates that I had on my behalf, my mentors, they were not Latinos. They were African American. One was Anglo. One, one was from another race. But it didn't matter. It mattered that someone paid attention and said, you know what, Hilda? You got a lot that you can offer, but you've got to focus it, and you've got to put it in the right direction. And somebody helped me do that. And it took a while, but I learned how to do it. And I know women can do that, too. Thank you. Up there. Hello. Uh, my name is Abby Schiff, and I'm a senior at the college. And uh, I would like to ask you, um, you did mention in your speech that um, you felt like you would be able to be a voice in the, in the Obama administration. And uh, you have worked in the past on HIV AIDS issues. And I know that you have said that you are interested in working on this issue. But um, I just would like to know, are you committing to talk to President Obama the next time that this comes up, uh, preferably before October 4th, about the issue of fully funding the Global Fund? Um, in addition, I'd like to know whether you would be involved in uh, administering the PEPFAR funds as part of the uh, Department of Labor, which the Department of Labor does. Um, and as a representative of the Department of Labor, would you be committed to increasing the amount of PEPFAR funds and Global Fund? funding? Well, that's an interesting and curious question you're asking, because I don't, I don't call the president uh, randomly and say, you know, I need to talk to you. It doesn't happen in that manner. Everything is kind of run through our offices ahead of time. But he knows that I'm here, and the White House knows that I'm here. And I'm sure they're, gonna, they're going to uh, also be aware that I spoke with a group of students outside, and, and I'm continuing to hear uh, your, your pleas now. And I understand that. And I'll do what I can to take the message back. Um, fortunately for me, a lot of what I'm doing is involved in helping to provide training opportunities for people in health care. 
and my priority is to get people here to get encouraged to be, uh, as, we call, as we say in Spanish, prometoras, people who can go out in the community and help give good examples and information to prevent diseases and chronic diseases from occurring in our communities, one of which would be HIV and AIDS, and one of which I fought very hard for in the health care reform bill, to have community workers go out and work here domestically. But that doesn't mean we can't share that idea over overseas and in other countries. I'm a big advocate for that and know that we can try to work on those things as well and those programs that I administer overseas, working with families, working with children, and working with women. Thank you. Yeah, um, my name is Matt. I'm a uh, first year medical student. And um, I just wanted to, to follow up on a couple questions that I asked before. And um, the Global Fund Replenishment Conference is on, um, is, is, is on Monday. There's uh, Obama's committed to, to $2 excuse billion dollars me, of funding. Is only We've already one. had two questions on this. And there's lots of other questions that people want to ask. And I want to be sure that we're fair to everyone. And uh, the secretary has responded, uh, I think, pretty clearly to two questions on this. Let's have some questions on some other topics, because I, I'm sure this isn't the only thing the audience is interested in. I mean, can, can I frame it sociologically, then? I mean, what, what, as, as someone that you said that you are a voice for the issues that don't come up. No, for, this is the for, question that was just, uh, look, I'm not trying to shut you down, but let's be fair to everybody here, OK? And I think we've, we've heard about the AIDS question. We've heard about it out there. So let's go on to the next question here. Thank you, uh, Madam Secretary. Thank you for showing up. My name is Brian Hall. I'm a first year MPP student, and I'm still kind of basking in the glory that I get accepted to Harvard. So um, <laughs> over the past 40 years, we've seen like this dramatic change in the structure of the US economy. Um, you know, skills learning has been placed at a premium. And we have this like uh, shift um, away from low-skilled, high-wage work that has essentially disappeared. Um, some people say, you know, education is kind of the, the answer, but but we have a structure in the economy that will always create low-wage jobs. And when we look at the future job projections, we see like 40 to 45 percent of the future growth in in the American economy is going to be based on these service economies, which are low pay. So how do you how do you reconcile that? We want we want Americans to have like like decent livelihoods, but with with the structure of the economy creating low wage, low skilled jobs, how do you how do you fix that? Well, it, it uh, it's going to take a lot of uh, developing of new policies, and the president through the Recovery Act, as I mentioned earlier, I'm administering about 500 million dollars alone that went out for training in green jobs, and what that means is actually retooling people. It means the welder, the electrician, the the people that were working in, in highly intensive areas, labor intensive, can now get into programs that'll help transition them into. Uh, an exchange where we can lessen our carbon footprint and hopefully transition into jobs that will be created here and that will stay here. And my hope is that we can provide an influx of enough money and capital so that we can have lithium batteries, solar panels, anything that goes in to those types of new industries, that that raw material is produced here. Right now we're importing from Tokyo, China, and other places. What I'd like to do is see that that changes. And the president is now putting a priority on saying we should stop the loopholes, the tax loopholes, from allowing people to get away with offshoring and taking their, their funds across, across the ocean and investing here. And so we can restore our manufacturing base that will be a cleaner, and me, I'm saying this, meaner type of industry that is actually going to bring more people their creativity, their skills, and technology, and that we can provide not just safe jobs, but good paying jobs that can sustain us and put people back in the middle class. That's really what has happened here in the last 30 and 40 years. We lost our base as a manufacturing industry here, as one of the, one of the major industries, and also the fact that we've outsourced so much. Those policies can change, and I think the president is on the right track to do that, and I am wholeheartedly looking at funding those kinds of opportunities that'll help incentivize this workforce, the low-skill workforce in particular, because I am deeply concerned about their future and their children's future. There is a way out of this, but we have to make some sacrifices, and we have to continue to invest in job skill development, training, and making sure that everyone feels a part 
of this, that it isn't just one group over another that gets an advantage. We can't, we can't afford to do that. And so I think the policies that the president is putting forward are exactly where we need to go. Thank you. Madam Secretary, thanks so much for joining us today. My name is Alexander Hurdle Fernandez, and I'm a first year doctoral student here in government and social policy. My question was about internships, which I feel have become a really essential stepping stone for a lot of young people today. And uh, unfortunately, it seems that the legal framework for internships hasn't really been um, considered. And there's been some analysis that suggests that quite a few of the internships that many college students and, and graduate students to embark upon may in fact be illegal. So I was, I was uh, hoping to ask you if um, the Obama administration and the Department of Labor would be considering internships um, and uh, as part of your broader enforcement regime. I know, well, that, I know that that's a question that we've been asked by our solicitor's office and, and we're going through our own analysis of that. But I can tell you at the Department of Labor, uh, I am a proponent of internships. I don't want to see people supplanted though, I'll be honest with you, because that comes up a lot, that somehow you're going to bring in someone who's going to do someone who had a full-time job and you're going to get rid of them to bring in an intern. I don't think that's right. Okay, so let me be clear on that. But I think it's absolutely essential for people who want to be involved and learn a craft or learn a trade or learn that they can put on their resume that they had work experience by being an intern. That is so important. My first job uh, in my master's program, in fact, was as a White House intern. And while I was a political science public administration uh, major, my first job was to write a newsletter. I was not a journalist. But that was my first job. And I didn't get paid for the first three months, which was fine, but I worked my tail off. And as a result of that, guess what? I got hired after that and I got a salary. So I think internships are great and I, and I certainly want to make those available as, as best we can, in this, in, at least in my department. And I'm a big proponent. In fact, a lot of people don't know that you don't have to just go to the White House or to the Capitol to be an intern. You can come and be an intern at the Department of Labor. You can work for wage and hour. You can work for some of our attorneys. You can work for some of our uh, individuals who work in employee benefits plans, all kinds, accountants. We're looking for people who have good analytical writing skills. And if you speak another language, boy, we're rolling. <clears throat> so where's the sign up for the internships? Is that <laughs> <laughs> right here. Over there. <laughs> Hello, my name is Amin Tofani. I'm a master's student here at uh, the Kennedy School doing economic policy, also a business student at Stanford. Mm -hmm. Madam Secretary, um, in, in light of the financial crisis, it has become very clear to us how easily people can lose their jobs. It seems to me that employees are exposed to market risks more than ever before. Yeah. At the same time, uh, it's fair to say that these employees, the majority of them, are not participants in the rewards. As an entrepreneur, my golden rule is the more risks that I take, the more rewards I can reap when the times are good. So what is your reaction to promoting a culture of profit and equity sharing in the corporate scene? Well, you know, part of, part of my responsibility is to, is to make sure that employees are not harmed. That, uh, in fact, that first of all, that they get their appropriate uh, benefits and pay that legally by law they are protected by. And of course, you know, businesses um, also have to play by the rules. Uh, and I'm hopeful that we can find opportunities. And I've seen some new upstart businesses, particularly in the renewable energy area where I've spent a lot of time, is where you do see more sharing, employee sharing, where employees actually have a stake in the stock. And they can determine where uh, investments are made with respect to health care with respect to decision making and on all, all kinds of levels. When I see that model used, I, I think productivity, innovation, and risk all goes up. And that doesn't happen a lot in some places, but there are some good employers who are exploring that. And it's probably happening in, more, in smaller areas than I'm hearing of, and I'd love to hear more about that. But I am very much a proponent of allowing for people to, to maximize and actualize their talents. Being a public administration, a background um, at USC, that's something that we looked at a lot in term, and I remember that very, very important to be able to, to allow for people to kind of share their talents and skills and allow them to bring about change. Because, and I, and I said it earlier, I, I like to surround myself with people who know a lot more than I do. Don't you? <laughs> I mean, wouldn't you? If you had a, if you had a, 
uh, look at uh, problem solving and you had to pick people, you'd want to have people that you could rely on, that you could trust, but that also had something to give, to offer. And I think that that's also a good business concept to, to follow. And I think that when I see businesses that have performed well, it's usually because they've had good policies and treatment of their employees, allowing them to have a voice, allowing them to speak up, and not um, ca you know, causing problems where if they speak out, they're a whistleblower, for example, they get fired or they get terminated. Or if they have a change of heart because maybe they want to you know, have collective bargaining that the, the employer feels threatened and that person is terminated. Those are not good things, but we have to have a healthy dialogue. And I think any environment that allows that is very is already far ahead of the game. Next question. Hi, Secretary Solis. Um, my name is Jason. I'm a master's candidate here at the Kennedy School. Um, I wanted to applaud your effort to um, step up um, enforcement of wage and hour and health and safety violations against, um, particularly against um, uh, foreign-born Hispanic workers. Um, but, um, you know, and I, I was glad to join you in Houston in April to, to sort of kick off that effort. Um, but I know, and, and you probably know, that um, our country's broken immigration system really makes that, that, that challenge a lot harder, creating sort of fears about reporting to folks who have been victim of wage theft or other abuses. Um, and on top of that, you have um, state efforts like the one that, 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 that's happening in Arizona, civilian um, police getting involved through the 287G program, et cetera. And I wanted to know, um, one, your thoughts about um, the role of the Department of Labor in terms of making that argument um, as to how the immigration laws are, are undermining standards? And secondly, um, what sort of innovations or um, uh, new practices are you going to have to devise because of those challenges in fulfilling your duties? Well, thank goodness I don't have to uh, devise new laws or anything because there are already a lot of laws in place to protect all workers. And that's something that has kind of we've lost sight of in the last decade, in the last administration. And what I've been able to do, at least attempt to do, is really empower all workers, especially low wage and vulnerable workers, people in the construction industry, for example. Did you know that there are more fatalities in the construction industry amongst Hispanics? And the notorious state that really has an atrocious record is Nevada and Texas. They're bad. And it's horrible. That shouldn't happen. But what we're trying to do is empower people so that they speak up and not fear that they're going to be retaliated against or lose their job, so that they understand their rights and they can talk to our regional staff on the field, Wage and Hour and OSHA. And that's why we've hired up 710 investigators in different units, but more importantly have required them to also speak the languages of the people they're supposed to be helping. And that is a big change. That has been a big change. And we're going to do more. The president supports comprehensive immigration reform. It would be nice if we could get any one of any four of those 11 Senate Republicans who voted for the same legislation, comprehensive immigration reform, to come back to the table, even in a lame duck session, and support CIR. And the president's supportive of that. He's making calls. We're all constantly talking about how we need to reform immigration. Just think if all these people came out of the shadows. We wouldn't have that underground economy. We wouldn't be seeing people taken advantage of. We would be seeing more money coming into education because these people would have to be paying taxes. So it's a win-win if we do uh, change our immigration laws. And it, and it should be done now. And we just have to keep applying pressure. So thank you for being a part of that. I hope to take the forum that you went to in Houston and take it around the country so that people understand any low-wage worker should not be taken advantage of, regardless of where you come from or what language you speak, or if you don't have a good command of the English language. You should not be discriminated against because of that. So we're standing up for those workers. Thank you very much. This will be our last question. Uh, thank you, Madam Secretary, for coming to speak to us today and also for fighting for the dignity of workers in America. Um, one important component of the dignity is safety in the workplace, and I'm sure we all recognize that. Um, but currently, OSHA does not have the um, ability to, to enact real regulation because often egregious um, violations of the regulations um, go punished with only fines of tens of thousands of dollars. Um, what does your administration, what is your administration doing um, 
in the, in the commitment to, to, to give OSHA teeth, to give, um, to give punishments like, uh, like real jail time to high-ranking um, high officials in these multi-billion dollar corporations that really can't be held accountable with such petty fines? Well, that's a good question. Um, part of what we're doing is kind of looking at reviewing all the previous regulations that have been approved in the past and really trying to update them and really bring up, and it isn't just OSHA, but it's also wage and hour, because there's a lot of atrocities that are happening in the workplace with respect to youngsters, with children. And those penalties have not been increased for like decades. So we're revamping a lot of our uh, regulations, and we're hoping to also increase penalties. But it isn't just that. It's also being able to have the authority, subpoena power, and other uh, terms and, and, and uh, techniques that we need to incorporate. And part of it is going to take legislative support. So part of what I say will have to somehow get across to members of the House and also to the Senate so that we can put packages together. Right now, there's several bills, one that we've been working on to help improve mine safety, to combat that 29 minor situation that happened. There's a bill pending right now in the House and the Senate, but it appears that special interests don't want to see that move. It'll make major, major reforms. There's also a good piece of legislation that Chairman uh, Miller has in his, in his labor committee that will also address issues with respect to OSHA, ramping up worker safety and protection that I know one of my good friends is very involved in. That's Congresswoman woman Lynn Woolsey from California. These are good bills that are there, and I think if we can get the public to focus in on uh, the legislative aspects, we can do a heck of a lot more through that route. Meanwhile, we'll attack it through regulations as well. And that's something that we have to just keep moving as we go through this process. So we're not going to give up, and we're always open to ideas. And we're looking for a few brave people like yourself to step up and maybe work for us. So. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm I'm sorry to have to conclude because it seems that the longer we go, the more fire we're getting here, <laughs> and this is a good thing. Please join me in thanking uh, Secretary uh, Hilda Solis <laughs> for being with us this afternoon. They fired me up. Yeah, it's great. It's good. It's really it's good. good. Thank you. Thank you, John. <laughs> that was, that was great. Thank you. It's great. Great to be here.